if I had to summarize in a few sentences what I'm going to say today, I would say the following. Uh, I think artificial intelligence can help us to be more creative. And I think we may want to be more creative in this specific moment in front of all the challenges we face, also including the challenges imposed by AI to us. So, but let's start over. Let me start with the, uh, the definition of creativity. Of course, I'm not going to give, but I leave you with these three excellent definitions. And I would say, Max, you've been very creative tonight because it is an intelligence having fun on this stage, I mean, 15 minutes ago. So what all these definitions have in common? I mean, at least in my opinion, I guess the point is in all cases, you are trying to cope with the unknown. And coping with the unknown is one of the most important activities of mankind. It always was, it is now probably more than, than ever. Uh, we are hopefully entering in the post-COVID phase, but this phase is a sort of uncharted territory. It's forcing us, I mean, to revisit our lives, our cities, our spaces, our interactions. So when we cope with the unknown, we are actually playing in a very special playground. So I guess Francois Jacob nicely spelled out the difference between the actual, okay, on your right, and uh, so the actual is what you experience already in the past and the possible. So the set of things you can possibly experience in the near future or in the far future. Okay. And of course, then a few years later, Stuart Kaufman refined this idea by introducing the notion of adjacent possible. So adjacent possible is a set of all things, could be ideas, could be molecules, could be technological products, which are one step away, so they are adjacent, one step away from what we know already. And of course, we can reach them by incremental modifications and recombination, perhaps, in the spirit of tinkering of the existing materials. So, Stuart Kaufman was coming from biology, thinking about the evolution in, in biology. Uh, what is special about the adjacent possible is it's not a static space. It's a space changing while you explore it. Let me give you one simple example uh, with a social network. So imagine that this is a very simple social network. I'm pretending to be the red spot here, okay? And the white spots are people I already met in the past. I can keep meeting now. For instance, now I meet Marika, and then at some point I meet Claudia. And then through Claudia, I can actually meet some other person, which would be the green spot I never met before. In this case, I mean, this morning I would have said Fabiola, but then I met Fabiola before jumping on this stage, so I mean, it would be already changed. But suppose now I'm in the moment in which I'm meeting Fabiola. What happens is there is a new part of the space appearing out of the blue. So this part of the space cannot be foreseen in advance unless you get to this very point in which you have a novelty experience. And of course, after this, there could be some other elements that can become possible at some later stages. So now we know a lot about this space. We constructed a mathematical structure to treat this problem. You can make a lot of predictions out of it and check this with data. So we are quite happy on the mathematical and physics side on this, but still we are baffled by this space. This space is really elusive. Why is elusive? It's elusive because, of course, we don't know anything about the green spots, right? So we cannot predict all the possible outcomes, all the possibilities in front of us. Of course, I mean, this is, uh, there is a good reason for this, because we are trying to predict something that never happened before. So, of course, we don't have a, we don't have a clue. Still, still we, we, we may want to take decisions, and we want to make predictions. And, of course, predictions are complicated. Someone said, I guess it was Niels Bohr, said predictions are very tough and difficult, especially about the future. I guess you all know this, so this is complicated. But still, we want to make predictions, and we have a few strategies to make predictions, also data-driven. So the typical strategies is to look at the future with the eyes of the past. So we look at all bunch of data from the past, try to make sense of this, in some cases constructing models out of it, and then try to project this model into the future. Okay, so it's working, not always working, okay, but in some cases, if you only rely on the past, this could be highly misleading. Now, I mean, let me just spend 30 seconds on a joke. It's not a joke, actually, so uh, this is real. I mean, this was uh, a news from The Guardian in 2017, self-driving cars of Volvo, this is important, Volvo, because it's Swedish, getting stuck in the outback of Australia in front of kangaroos. Can you imagine why? 
course, I mean, kangaroos were not in a training set of a Swedish company, elks and caribous and other stuff. Okay. Now, of course, now you can teach a machine what a kangaroo is, but then there will be the next kangaroo, right? Okay. So somehow one has to be prepared for the, for the unknown, one has to be prepared for something, and we should realize that we are living in a non-stationary system. Our rules are not fixed forever, they are evolving over time. So systems are increasing the number of states in which they, they could be. AI was not there okay, 70 years ago, but now I'm mean accelerating a lot. So the rules of the game are changing all the time, and treating non-stationary system is not, is not obvious. So of course, now there is a lot of activity, and we heard this morning also about this, in order to make machine learning better prepared for, let me say, novelties, okay, so online learning. But of course, there are pitfalls. So catastrophic forgetting is one of these pitfalls. I would also say that perhaps uh, the sustainability of this kind of computation is not obvious also for, for, for other kind of reasons. But still, I mean, this is a very important point. How we cope with non-stationary systems. I give you just one example, not because it's the most important, but because it's something in which I'm involved. It's a very small corner. And uh, with, uh, with a friend and colleague, Alessandro Londei, we're actually working on a different kind of protocols for learning and we dub dreaming learning. So we let machine dream. Okay, what does it mean, dreaming? Dreaming means creating artificial sequences out of the knowledge already acquired up to a certain point. And of course, you can tune this generation by a temperature. So a very small temperature you have uh, Basically, you reproduce the already existing uh, sequences. At high temperature, you create random sequences. In the middle, there could be a sweet spot. The sweet spot somehow is reminiscent of the adjacent possible we, already, we have already seen. So to make the story short, I mean, it seems that those machines trained with this dreaming learning are better prepared for, for, uh, for the novelties. And actually, what you see here is actually is the outcome of a prediction experiment done on a truly uh, no stationary system in which new characters and new elements are appearing all the time. It seems to be working, but of course, I mean, there is a lot to do. There is the beginning of the journey, and uh, it would be very, very important, I mean, to follow this line to get self-aware machine, self-aware, also aware of the mutated conditions. So I'm getting to the conclusion because I would say it's important to have self-aware machines, but I would also argue that it would be important to exploit, I mean, machines to become more creative. So I would argue for a sort of augmented creativity, which is a sort of synergy between machine and us. I will conclude with two little examples we are working on in our uh, lab in Paris, uh, which are on the one hand, co-creation processes. We basically create tools for musicians, for writers to compose, okay, in general. And of course, in this case, there is a sort of continuous dialogue between the machine and the, and the human being, and an evolutionary process in which the machine is acting as a sort of wise navigator in this ever-expanding space of possibilities. The second example is about sustainability. So, of course, solving important problems. Creativity is also finding solutions for important problems. And in this case, we are constructing a lot of platforms through which humans can actually look at the present through models and data, but also project this in a sort of what-if experiment. So what happens if I take this action? Of course, you need right models, I mean, to do this. But AI, in this sense, I mean, is very, very helpful because the kind of parameters is huge and already expanding the adjacent possible and navigating us in this highly dimensional space would be very important. So I conclude by saying that uh, I really look forward, I mean, for this synergy to be true. And I would also argue that this synergy could be important also for us, I mean, to understand better our, our intelligence and also to use our intelligence to address the societal challenges, including AI. Thanks a lot for your attention.